I told Brother Danny one of these days we're going to get a piano player that will practice. <laughs> telling you. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brethren. Amen. But it is good to be in the house of the Lord again tonight Amen. to come to praise and magnify his name, for he is worthy. Amen. Amen. I don't know what's been going on in your life today, but every moment, I see Jesus. Everything that happens, I see Jesus. Yes. It doesn't matter how good they talk about it. It doesn't matter how bad they talk about it. I still see Jesus. Right. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we're so thankful to be back in your house just one more time. God, to be able to stop long enough just to praise and magnify our risen Savior. Lord, to look unto you, O oh God, for our need and, Lord, for our opportunity that we might bless your name. Father, be with us today. Be with us in this service, O oh God. Bless and anoint our pastor, O oh God. Give him strength. Give him the anointing of the Spirit of God. Give him of your boldness, O oh Lord, to speak your word in spirit and in truth. And Father, we ask you, O oh God, if there be a need in this house, that Lord, that you would minister to that heart right now. And Lord, that you would strengthen and gird with your truth. And Master, we'll bless you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Children and through all of us. Amen. Amen. pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're just so humbled by your presence, Lord, and we just thank you for the worship service, Lord. Everybody here could feel you, Lord. Lord, I just ask that you take this offering, receive it, and multiply it for thy kingdom. For it's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen.
Father, we are grateful to know what your word says concerning you and concerning the times you'll come back. For as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be. And Lord, we look at that and we think about that and we realize that on that day, every knee will bow. There's coming that time. Those who reject you now are going to know you then. Lord, help us to be ready. Help us to know that we can bow today and not be ashamed nor afraid. We honor you and we praise you and we thank you. God, just be with us now. Bring a word for us that we can hear and understand. Teach us tonight. And we just tell you we sure love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, it's good to see all of you here, and I appreciate it, and I know God does, that we can gather in his house. No better place to be than to be in his house, so thank you for being here. And before I get started tonight, Ms. Reed is going to share a word with us. Art will be coming home Wednesday if everything goes well. God has blessed him and helped him, and we're certainly thankful for it. All right, open your Bible to the book of Job, or Job, whichever one you want to call it. All right, and let me, let me tell you a couple of things to begin with. We're going to open the doors of the church, and if you desire to join the church and you haven't told us yet, make sure that you come to um, who are we coming to? Dana. She's up top, so don't come up there to her. But Dana, see Dana. She's up top there. And tell her, if you, we're going to have a, a baptismal service here very soon. If you desire to be baptized, you need to let Dana know so we can get the, the list ready and get everything ready for that. So tell, join the church to baptize. Make sure you tell Dana. The other thing is next Sunday night we'll be having church elections. 
the nominating committee has met and they did a wonderful job and we think we have the nominations ready to present to you so next Sunday night <clears throat> in the service we'll do that Job chapter 13 One verse that you're very familiar with, verse 15. It says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain mine own ways before him. And this morning, I talked to you about even though. Even though things are bad. Even though I don't see a way out. I'm going to trust the Lord. The book of Lamentations is a book of grief. Lament. Lamentations. Lament means to grieve. And that's exactly what the prophet was doing. And things had gotten so bad. He said, the thought of my pain and my homelessness is bitter poison. Gall, bitter poison, he said. I think of it constantly, and my spirit is depressed. Yet hope returns when I remember this one thing. The Lord's unfailing love and mercy will continue. And it will be fresh as the morning, as sure as the sunrise. And then the psalmist David said, weeping may endure for a night. But... Joy comes in the morning. Even though things are bad, even though I'm discouraged, even though I'm depressed, even though I don't know what's going on, yet will I trust in the Lord. Now, we're going to look at another even though tonight, and we're going to look at Job. We're going to talk about him. And we're going to look at some of the words that he had to say. In Job chapter 14, verse 1, it says, Man that is born of a woman is of few days and full of trouble. Hmm. Men, we had the women to blame for this. Man that is born of woman has few days and his days are full of trouble. We need to be test tube babies. <laughs> that, that verse then would read that man that is born of a test tube has long life and has nothing but great triumphs. It's too late for us, but there is a future for we men. Now, understand what he says. Few days and full of trouble. I mean, that's a prediction for us. That means we've got a lot to look forward to, doesn't it? Few days full of trouble. As we think about that, that's not what we want. We want long life, and we want our lives to be full of triumphs, not troubles. But we don't get that. So we look at Job, and Job, in his despair, in his discouragement, and all the things he goes through, he says, I realize one thing. Man that is born of woman lives only a few days and has great trouble. He's lost everything that he had. He has nothing. So we got a man of sorrows looking out to us in the future, saying to us, understand this, if you're born, you're going to have trouble. And you're only going to live a few days. And living a few days is not saying the numbers of your days, 60, 70, 80, 90. He's not saying that. But you only live a few days. Just making a comment. It just seems, I mean, we say it all the time. It just seems like yesterday. It just seems like yesterday I, I was holding Stephanie. It just seems like yesterday, you know, they were, it just seemed, 
because time's flying by. And that's what he's saying. We only have a few days. And those few days are full of trouble. At this moment, he's not talking about any triumph. He's telling the truth. They're full of troubles. And he says, I ought to know because I'm one. Life is short. And there are going to be many traps along the way. At my age, I look back and I think just yesterday I was in school. Just yesterday I was this. Where did time go? And when you reach 40, it goes downhill. I mean, you own one of them sleds that's going 90 miles an hour. You own one of them choo-choo trains going up to 40, saying, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. But you hit that 40 and watch what happens. You see, so he says, you know, it's just, it's just a short period of time, but it's full of traps, full of trouble. Any of you in here ever lived and not had any trouble? If you have, <laughs> oh goodness, if you've ever lived and haven't had any trouble, see me after the service and I will introduce you to Mary Moore. And you will have trouble. Job had lost his family. He lost his friends. He lost his livelihood. He lost his wealth. Everything that he had was gone. He was full of sores, couldn't sleep. And the friends he thought were his friends, he found out were not his friends. Now, none of us have troubles compared to Job. Anybody in here ever lost your fortune? You know why? Never had a fortune. So we should be discouraged about that, be full of despair about that. Everybody else has it. Why don't we? What part of Job do we know? But you know, you don't have to lose your fortune. You don't have to lose your family. You don't even have to have your friends turn on you to experience part of what Job was going through. Because what I have and because of what you have, those things are important to us. We may not have much, but they're our wealth. They're the things that God has given us and the things that we think we need to exist. And we might not be as well off as somebody else, but at least we can, and we fill in that gap. We can go. We can do this. We can do that. But you take those things from us and see what you have. But at least I can walk. Take that from you and see what you have. At least I can breathe. Take that from you and see what you have. At least I've got good friends. Take them from me. What do you have? See, this is what Job was going through. This is what he was feeling. He was a man that had tasted triumph just about in everything he'd ever done. Just like he had never failed. He succeeded with everything. And all of a sudden, he doesn't have triumph anymore. He now has trouble. And Job can't figure it out. Something's not right. And he's racking his brain trying to figure it out. And Job, in his own mind, knows that he is good. That's the problem here. He knows he's good. Think about sometimes you going along and, and your life's good and you're serving the Lord and things are like they should be in your life and then all of a sudden something goes bad. And I mean, not a hangnail or a toenail. Something goes bad in your life. Now you've got to figure it out. And usually the first things we start doing is say, well, God, you know I love you, and God, you know I'm serving you, and God, I go to church. I mean, look, I, I go three times a week. I go to Saturday night prayer. I go to Sunday school, Lord. You know I'm faithful. Why? See, and we do all this stuff like that because we can't figure out why would God do that to us. And Job is trying to figure out why has this happened and he goes back to that verse, and he tries to understand that verse. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain mine own ways before him. We don't ever talk about that last part. 
Job stood up in the midst of it and said, Though God slay me, I'm still going to serve him. But I'm going to maintain my innocence. I'm going to argue my case before God. I have a defense, and I'm going to give it to God. Now think about it. How many of us are willing to stand up before God and defend ourselves? How many of us are as sure of our salvation as Job was? Though he slay me, I'm still going to serve him. But I'm going to defend myself before him because I haven't done anything wrong. And which one of us in here tonight can say we haven't done anything wrong? But Job was steadfast in that. And you have to understand, Job was born before Calvary. He didn't, he didn't have the New Testament like we do, the understanding of God and God's ways like we do. But he had something even deeper than that. We must not blame God for our troubles. Because God loves us. He allows things to happen, but they're only for our good. And Job is trying to figure that point out as best he can. Job shows us that in our toughest moments that we'll ever face, we can have triumph. That first book, it said, Triumphant Warriors in a Turbulent World. Triumphant Warriors. In a turbulent world. And that's exactly what this world is. Mine and your world is turbulent at times. But we can be triumphant. We can win. But we need to look at how Job was able to do it. And I want to show you that. That even though your whole world caves in. We can still reach in there and grab triumph out of our troubles. But most of us are used to grabbing troubles out of our triumphs. Because we're negative. And we don't take time to see the goodness and the blessings of God. Hmm. Go to Tommy Smith. Ask him how he's doing. Ask him how his health is. You want to be lifted up? You want to see a triumph out of trouble? Yeah. But mine and your witness, what is it? What do people see and hear in ours? Is it trouble out of our triumphs or triumphs out of our troubles? We've got to learn how to win. And a lot of us don't know that. Job goes on to begin to explain this. And he says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms have destroyed this body, Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Job said, I'm in trouble. I don't understand it. Have you, have you ever been punished by your parents for something you didn't do? I was all the time. <laughs> and I, I kept trying to tell Mama, it's not me. It's David. I'm the angel, remember? <laughs> she didn't buy that for some reason. But we've been accused falsely. And, and really, you know, you, we, we can't understand it. We know we didn't do anything. But yet we've been accused of it. And what is your response when that happens? And all those probably handle it different. But when you're falsely accused, what do you do? And here Job understands in his mind, he's saying, I'm being falsely accused of something. I haven't done anything wrong, but yet these things have happened to me. And it's got to be because 
somebody thinks I've done something wrong. But I know I haven't. I know I haven't. And I think we've all probably been in that case before. We've been accused of things that we, you know, you know, and you know, and you know, and you know that you didn't do anything wrong. And we can't figure it out. Why is this happening to me? And that's exactly what he's saying here. You know, I, I don't understand it. I know that I love God and I know I'm going to serve God. But I don't understand what's going on. And at this point, he can't even have a conversation with God. He wants to, but he can't. So he gets here, and he says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. Now Job knows something that he shouldn't know. Job was a whole lot smarter than what people give him credit for, especially spiritually. For I know that my Redeemer liveth. God is unmovable. And God is victorious. I know my God lives. I know that. He's not talking about breathing. He's talking about God is God, the Lord God Almighty. My God, I know that he lives. And I know that he is my redeemer. How does Job know these things? My redeemer? You and I know that because he went to Calvary and died for our sins, he redeemed us. How did Job know that? He hadn't experienced it. He didn't know about it. But he knew something about God that most of the people, maybe nobody else back in that time knew. He knew there was a God in heaven. He knew he was alive and well. And he knew that that God was his redeemer. I know he is. He is my redeemer. He will redeem me from my sins. How he knew that. Was it through the Holy Spirit? It's the only way you can say it. My know my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. How did he know that? He looked forward in history and he said, One day, when this earth comes, comes to an end, my Redeemer will stand on this earth. We're told in the book of Revelation that our Redeemer will stand on that last day. And we're told where he will stand. But Job looks up in history. My Redeemer, he will be standing at the end. And all of us will be down. We'll either be dead or we're going to bow before him. But he will stand. He knows that about God. And he's serious about it. He shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body... Yet in my flesh shall I see God. Again, how did he know that? Job said, I'm going to die. My Redeemer won't. He's alive today. He'll be alive at the end. My Redeemer liveth. But I'm going to die. And when the worms eat this body, and there is nothing in that grave but some bones, I know I'm going to see God. I know that. How does he understand and know that? What, what is there that this man possesses, yet in my flesh I shall see him? I'm going to die in that grave and, and just rot away, but I'm going to be brought up out of that grave, and one day I'm going to see my Redeemer. Where had he been taught that? Again, you see the Holy Spirit working in Job. That he knows things beyond his understanding, his comprehension. One day I'm going to die, but he's going to stand because my Redeemer liveth. And one day I'm going to see him in the flesh. That's the promise you and I have. That the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those of us who are alive and remain shall be gathered up together with them to meet the Lord in the sky. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. How did he know that? This is the man that Job is trying to talk to. So Job is affirming here that God is alive and well. He, he's, he's saying to us he is a spiritual being that he will be the last one. And I know I'm going to die, but I know I'll be born again. He's talking to him. 
Now think of how humble Job must be at this moment. Job knew God. I want you to think about that for a moment. He knew God. How many of us in here tonight know God? Most of us are like my old neighbor. He said, Danny, I know enough about a lot of things to get me in trouble. And that's about all I know. See, we don't know God. We know about God. And there's a world of difference in that. Job knew God. I know. He knew God. He knew things about God that he shouldn't know. He talked about things that he shouldn't even know anything about, yet he did. Because he had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. I know my Redeemer liveth. I know that. And I know that one day I'll see him. I know. See, Job, Job had it right. It's not enough to know about God. It's not enough to know somebody that knows God. It's not enough. We've got to know God ourselves. We've got to know who he is. We've got to be able to make a powerful statement about our God. And it'd be a statement that you can stand on and believe in. I know. And you fill in the blanks. Job knew. And he's trying to teach us that lesson. The words we say, the things we do, speak volumes about how well we know God. I wonder sometimes how much our language is going to be changed when we meet God. Little words we say now that we don't think anything about. I wonder, is God going to, are we going to stand there and be condemned on that day because of our language? Something we take for granted. We forget that people judge us. And that is something that happens to us when we become a Christian. We're going to be judged. Fairly and unfairly. That doesn't make any difference. We're going to be judged. And our language is one of the biggest things today. We say things we should never say. But we don't understand how it affects other people. We don't understand how ugly it sounds. We don't. And we don't care. And then when somebody says something, you just slough it off. No big deal. Old fogey. Our actions are going to condemn us one day. Our words, our actions, our deeds, our thoughts, and our ways. All those things will condemn us one day before God. So how close we are to God, how well we know God, will determine how we do those things that we're going to be judged by one day. And the closer we get to God, the more we're going to change our language. The closer we get to God, the more we're going to understand how this language, even though we don't think anything about it, it offends and it's wrong and it doesn't uplift God. The closer we get to God, our actions are going to change because the Spirit's going to remind us, no, you shouldn't do that. You should do this. You shouldn't go there. You should get. It's going to tell us, and we're going to get closer. Just like Job, how did he know all those things? Because he got close to God. And the closer we get to God, the greater the secrets that God reveals to us. Because he understands he can trust us, and he understands that he wants to share all those things so that we can take it and use it for his glory. Our actions, our deeds, our ways, our thoughts, everything about us will change the closer we get to God. The one of us in here that thinks he's the most holiest, this whole, uh, the most holiest of all the people in this building, I guarantee you there are going to be some changes in his life the closer he gets to God. And that person is not going to be upset about it. We're going to be glad. Because we're getting closer to God. It doesn't, mean, it doesn't matter about what's changing. We're getting closer to God. And that's what we feel. And Job was doing, doing that. And he was trying to live it. And he said, I will see God. I will see God. Not I will see God, blah, every sinner we're going to see God. But I will see God. I will see God in a way I've never seen him before. I'm going to see God the way that he loves me. Can you think about that? 
Job says, I'm going to see him. Oh, yeah, I'm going to see him. But he said, I'm going to see something about God I've never seen before. And it's not going to frighten me. It's going to pull me into a closer relationship with him. What a thought. Wouldn't you like to be closer to God? Yeah. Changes are going to come. We've got to believe that God is active in our life. He's active in our life. And we need him to be active. He says, he paused before he said it. But he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. So Job steps back and he looks and he thinks. He says, God knows the way I go. He knows the steps I take. In other words, God knows where we are. Does anybody in here know where God is? You don't because we can't see him. He's over here, he's over here, he's over here. We know he's everywhere at once, right? We know that, but that's not the answer. There comes a time in mind in your life when we can't find God. You ever gone through trials and tribulations and cried out to God and cried out to God and cried out to God and he didn't answer you? And you say, God, how long have I got to put up with this mess? And we prayed. We even came to Saturday night prayer. See if we could find him there. We just can't find him. And we don't know where he is. It's like God has just left the earth and I'm, I'm alone and I have no help and I have no hope. Job was in that fix. He said, I don't know where God is. He even got to the point, he said, God, if you'll just come down and, and just talk to me, I believe we can reason this thing out. Now, all I need you, if you, because Job couldn't feel him, he couldn't see him, he couldn't hear him, and Job didn't know where God was. And if you've never been in that situation, I hope you never get in it. But I got a feeling every one of us have been there. That's why we need a church that can help us pray. Can reach God with their prayers. Because there are times our prayers just don't seem to make it. And we need somebody praying for us and somebody praying with us. Maybe their prayers can get up and we can go around this blockade that's in my life. And maybe we can get to God. Job had three friends. I don't think he dialed their number, but he had three friends come up, and they're going to help him. They're going to, you know, they're the prayer partners, you know. They're the prayer group that meets on such and such a night, and they meet at the Dairy Queen, and we're the prayer group. And they get together, and they gossip for an hour and call that their prayer meeting. That's what these three men were. They were his best friends. And he didn't call them, but they came because they were going to help Job figure this thing out. And before you know it, they've got him in condemnation. They're telling him, you're a sinner because God would never do this to you if you hadn't sinned, Job. So confess your sins, and all this will be great. Liars. That's what they are. It wasn't true. But these are the ones that came to console him. And Job had to be able to call on God. I don't know where God is, but... I know that he knows where I am. <laughs> Isn't that good? I don't have to know where he is. All I have to know is that he knows where I am. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Lo, I am with you to the end of the earth. When I finally stand and I'm the last one standing, I am with you then. And I'll meet every need. And I will give to you the things that you need in your life, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, because I am God, and you're my children. God knows where we are. Not just that he knows I'm standing here. He knows where I am in my life. He knows the things I'm going through. He knows the struggles I'm facing. He knows those trials and those tribulations that I'm facing now and that are out there in front of me. He knows that because he knows where I am. And God cares about me. I got a God that loves me. My God loves me so much that he died for me. 
My God loves me so much that beside his refrigerator, he's got my picture. And he looks at it every day. He says, I love that boy. God loves us. I mean, think about it. As sorry as we are, as unfaithful as we are, <laughs> he loves us. Think about it. How many people do you know like that, that love you no matter what? I can, well, there's uh, um, um, well, anyway, because every time we go to name somebody that loves us no matter what, we're reminded of the time that they didn't love us no matter what. <laughs> so what are we going to do? You go back and think, hey, I don't see how God can love me because I'm unlovable. I do wrong. I've messed up. I've done against him. And we say all those things, but then you look at Job, and Job says, but he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Job's making a bold statement. He's saying, listen, I know, I know he loves me, and I know he cares, but I have not done anything wrong. He was adamant about it. I haven't. And I don't know why this is happening, but I know that he knows where I'm at. I know that he knows what I'm going through because I've had a personal experience with God. And Job holds his head up and he tries to get it all figured out. He says, when he tests me, I'm going to come out as gold. Job is saying that when God finally comes and I defend myself to him, he's going to look at me and he's going to count me as pure and holy because I've done nothing wrong. What a statement. What a statement. Job didn't understand then what he's going to understand in a little bit, but he was trying to stand on what he believed. I haven't done anything wrong. And we say it so many different times, why has all this happened to me? We can't let trials and tribulations overwhelm us. They happen to everybody. But we have a Redeemer that loves us. He walks through those things with us. He came to the disciples when that Sea of Galilee was so fixing to sink their boat. He came to them, walking on the water. Going to walk by them until somebody called out. You know, there's a story right there. We don't call out to Jesus enough. Many times he walks right past us during our trials because we're so focused on the trials that we don't see God. We're so focused on the bad things we're going through that we don't think about the good things with God. And he just walks right past us. On the road to Emmaus, he was with those men and he was going to walk right past their house. He was going to keep on going. But they begged him and begged him, please come in, please come in. And he came in and that's when he revealed himself to them. Many times we let him walk right on past us because we're not focused on God like we should be. And we need to get it because there's coming a time. We can't let these troubles and trials overwhelm us. Again, he says, after I leave my body and my skin has been destroyed, I know I will see God. I know that in the end it's going to happen. God knows me personally. Personally, he knows us. He's not a distant friend. God knows my name. He does. He knows my name. He knows everything about me. He knows whether I'm walking in his way or not. He knows me. And why does God know me in such a way? Because he loves me. When you love somebody, you want to know everything about them. Everything about them. And you can't get enough of them. You know that? You can't get enough of them because you just love them. And that's the way God is with us. He loves us. He can't get enough of us. Yeah, think about it. Because there's so much he wants us to do. Again, I, I, I go back to that thought that God brought this morning. If, if all God wants me to do is to love Richard, and to love Billy, 
and minister to them so that God can pour his blessings out on them. It's not about me. And he sees that within me is the ability to reach. And then he's going to fill them in such a way that that same power, that same strength is going to go from them to somebody else. And it just moves around. And God blesses. We talk about his spirit coming down, filling the house. He fills the house one at a time. He blesses the same way. And it just burns like a fire. A fire has to be lit somewhere. And it just starts and goes. And that's what God does for us and what he wants to do. He says, I'm going to make sure that I love the Lord the way I should. Job understood. Those three guys that came to him, they tried to convince him he had sinned. He said, I have not. doesn't matter what you say. I know I have not. One day I'll stand before God. And believe you me, that came quicker than what Job thought. Because when God came back to Job, and Job saw him again, he says, I knew about my Savior. Now I have seen him and I know. Not I know about, but I know. And Job became humble because Job did sin. You see, in his confrontation with God, the way he did it was wrong. And God reminded him of that. And Job repented. And he said, Job, if you'll go back and pray for your three buddies, I'll even forgive them. See, God, he wants to bless others through us. So Job's got to go back, even though he didn't do anything wrong, and apologize to them and pray for them. So like I said, pray for Richard, pray for Billy, and then God wanted to bless them with salvation. What a God we serve. We can never figure him out. But as we go through these things in life, just go through them with a smile on your face because God knows where you are, and he's going to work it out. He will work it out. He has a master plan. Just wait on him. In the meantime, make sure you can stand there and say, I, I know my Redeemer liveth, and I know the last day he'll be standing, and I know that I haven't done anything wrong. But God, if I have, please help me to know it. And I will repent. That's the God we serve. Father, I thank you because you're a God of second and third and fourth and fifth chances. You died for us. And you want us to live for you. So God, since you died for us, you, you don't just throw us away. You wait and you wait and you teach and you wait and you wait. And I pray that you will help us to realize the goodness of God. And that in some ways we can be like Job. And that we'll know that you live. And that we'll find out that you are watching us. And you do know everything about us. And you want us to come to you. Fall on our face. And be able to say, Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Thank you for your salvation thank you for your blessings and even though things are bad I'm going to serve the Lord let that be our commitment even though he slay me yet will I serve him thank you for the commitments that we can make to you we pray it all in Jesus name amen